Hello, everyone. I'm Donato Cava. I'm here with my uh, colleague, Sahan. And we work with Professor Kinsey. We're coming out of Boston University. And I'm here to, to introduce the BRIS-5, a design, uh, design space exploration architecture toolbox. So here's a quick outline of the presentation. I'm going to begin with the motivation, move on to the processors. I'll touch on the memory subsystem network on chip. I'll explain what the BRIS-5 ecosystem is, and then I'll conclude. So why do we need BRIS-5? Um, even though BRIS-5 is open source, all the traditional design challenges are still present. In terms of getting the right performance, power, memory organization, security, and so on, there are two general approaches, software simulation and hardware emulation. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. On the software simulation side, the advantages include easy access to internal states of modules, and uh, faster compilation time. However, the disadvantage is that you trade accuracy for speed. On the hardware emulation time, you've now made up that accuracy, but you've traded off in terms of your design time and simulation time. Our solution is circumvented by designing synth a synthesizable RTL and uh, using FPGAs to, ex to accelerate execution. And we present BRIS-5. So what is BRISC-5. It's the Boston University RISC-5 platform that delivers RTL level correctness for design exploration. Um, it's comprised of uh, various, uh, various systems of, of various complexities that, that are written in synthesizable of RTL for, to map directly to an FPGA. What it's comprised of, as I said, it's a full design exploration development toolbox. It's comprised of uh, Expandable and reconfigurable RISC-V cores, memory, subsystems, and some scalable, scalable interconnects. What's it like to use BRISC-V from the user perspective? We give you the software environment utilizing uh, the GCC's RISC-V, and uh, basically to get you to put out a uh, configuration-aware application, which you then, that configuration is based off of the components that you've chosen in your hardware design, and then you're able to map those directly to FPGAs. So now I've kind of explained what BRIS-5 is. I'm going to kind of get into the details here of what the processors look like. All of the processors are designed to fit into an SOC, provided you give them their own binaries, routing tables, and um, a starting PC per core. The processor cores are all base RV32i. Um, they're oblivious to the memory hierarchy and uh, network topology. And uh, the idea is basically you can change around, the, they're all parameterized, and you can change around those parameters and swap them in and out with uh, no change to the rest of your platform. So to, the first processor I'm going to display here is the, it's our smallest and lowest complexity, our single cycle processor. Since it is a single cycle, it doesn't fully utilize block RAMs on the FPGAs, and its execution is the sum of all the stages. Uh, next up is the five cycle processor. Again, these processors will be presented in, a, in the as their complexity increases. So this is our five-staged pipeline processor. Um, it's, it, we have two versions, one that uses forwarding and one that uses stalling. If it fits your needs, please feel free to use it. Um, but its FPGA still implementation, implementation is still limited. Next up is our seven-cycle processor. Here we've added a two-cycle memory stages to get it up to seven cycles. Um, now this one is actually fully uh, full cache integration support that we've also developed and it's also able to utilize block ramps. The final, and the final processor of the set is our small out-of-order processor. It's out-of-order execute within order commit. Again, it expands modules from before. We've added an instruction queue, a scheduler, and a commit module that's parameterized in a way to kind of make it easy to swap out um, these register files. If you, if you want to do like a, an ISA extension, it's trying to make it as easy as possible. To, again, there's not in there, but if you wanted to add it, the idea was to make it as easy as possible. Here are some of our synthesis results. Uh, the Fmax case here is pretty bad, but like, it, please ignore it. These are here. They're simple. They're meant to be expanded upon and improved as you want to use them. Um, however, it, this is just to illustrate that they do map to FPGAs. With that being said, I'm going to hand off some of the presentation to my colleague, Zahan. Hi. So the BRISC-V toolbox supports a configurable memory subsystem. So this is an expanded view of how the memory subsystem interacts with the processor cores and the network on chip. <clears throat> so the BRISC-V supports 
configurable multi-level cache hierarchies. So there are two types of cache modules. First, the primary caches, they are blocking caches with two cycle pipeline access. And then the secondary caches, they, they are designed to support a parameterized number of ports with round robin arbitration and this was to use that, like any, any of the secondary levels, basically. So then all the caches are inclusive write back caches. Then by default, they support true LRE replacement and also messy cache coherence is supported by the cache hierarchy. So these modules are like meant to act as you know, st starting points for a designer to build upon and expand on them. So all of these features can be easily changed by a user. They are built in like a number of user configurable parameters. So like usually the caches take up you know a significant portion of your area and power budget. So it's useful to have you know number of tunable parameters so that you can make your cache system fit your requirements as closely as possible. So in this case, a user can start with basic parameters like number of cache sets, then the cache line width, or then change the associated width of the caches. So on the bottom, we have put together a few, like some synthesis results by changing these parameters. Again, these are here to show that the parameterization works without any issues. And you can also change the number of levels in your cache hierarchy. Um, that's, that's nine. And so the whole cache system is designed in a very modular fashion. So there are clear interfaces. There are clear interfaces which are consistent across the levels. So that allows a user to replace any of the levels with, with, their, own or with their own modules. And so even the, to change this function, some of the functionalities of these module, of the components, it's because of the module design, it's a matter of replacing one of just one module uh, to change some of the functionality and you don't have to make significant changes to the rest of the design. And the last level cache is interfaced with the uh, memory interface module, which can, has the address resolution logic for a, a distributed shared memory situation. So the address resolution logic determines whether a, a memory request from the processor can be served at the local memory or whether it should be sent out to the network on chip to be served by a remote node. So the size of the main memory can be, uh, can be changed on a per node basis. So that allows to go for several different kinds of memory configurations. They can go for a centralized shared memory or a distributed shared memory system where there again you can do uniform or non-uniform distributed memory. Also the memory interface uh, that acts, acts as like, apart from the handling the address resolution logic, it also bridges the gap between the main memory and the cache subsystem. So that simplifies, that decoupling simplifies the use of off chip memory in a FPG implementation. And next I'll, talk, I'll be talking about the network on chip. So the default routers in BRISC-V, they are conventional virtual channel routers. Like every phase uh, corresponds to a pipeline stage in the router. And in the routers, the number of input output ports, the virtual channels per port, and the virtual channel depth is parameterized. So a user can configure the routers to fit any specific resource usage or performance requirements. And this is how the interface for the router looks like. The packetizer handles all the packetizing and depacketizing of data flow to and from the routers. And it has two separate interfaces, one for the local memory and, the, uh, and then another for the uh, memory interface. So this allows any request, any memory request which cannot be served by local memory to send directly to the router without going through the local memory. And also on the other side, um, when, the route, when, there's a, when this node is serving a request from a new remote node, the the packetizer actually uh, uh, have direct memory access so that it doesn't have to disrupt the other operations of the local memory hierarchy. And so the network on, network on chip on BRISC five provides like several other configurable parameters. For example, a user can use uh, buffers or buffered routing. Then when it comes to routing algorithms, since it supports uh, table-based routing, you can always implement new routing algorithms by. Uh, configuring the routing table entries. Then you can, a user can also change the network topology by 
simply configuring the number of in out input output ports and routing table entries. And with that, I'll uh, let Donato to talk about the RISC V ecosystem. Okay, so if you guys want to go use RISC V, where do you get it? That's our ecosystem here. So part of our ecosystem is we want to make it as easy as possible for you to get the, your application onto the FPGA. So we also provide a compiling script that utilizes GCC um, so for you to get your, uh, you can go play with it, but like it's generally just there to get your, your application into the FPGA in Verilog Hex. Um, we also have, so where you get Verse 5 is on our website. Um, you'll see here, this is what the main page looks like. We have news and updates for when new modules are released. And also, it's where if there's a problem and you'd like to take part, because it is open source, uh, this is where you do that reporting. We also s support some GUI support. Um, basically, we wanted to make the parameterizing of these processors easy and to avoid uh, errors. We have this visual interface where you can plug in your parameters and it'll spit out uh, what you've selected. And we also have this Brisk 5 emulator. It's a multi-level verification tool. Um, it's available through the website. And it runs inside your platform. It runs inside your browser, so it is platform independent. Um, also included in the ecosystem in our final documentation, we do try to provide uh, these wiring signal diagrams so that it's not just very loggy looking at. You can kind of get an understanding of how the signals are routed throughout the entire processor and what they're actually doing in our designs. And finally, uh, to kind of make the case home for the hardware emulation side, here's an example of the accuracy we were talking about. We eventually we were using our processors and they were passing all of our functional tests and we went and put it onto a FPGA to render a Mandelbrot set and you'll see here we immediately found out that we had an arithmetic shift error and we were able to go and correct it. And that's kind of just the, that, that bug would have never been found if we didn't actually put it on an FPGA. Um, or maybe it would have. So I also mentioned I would talk about the uh, secure designs that are actually using RISC-V. So one of them is known as Hermes. It's a secure SOC design. It's in our lab. Also, we have Janus, a cache uh, subsystem obfuscation architecture that's utilizing some of the BRISC-5 infrastructure. And finally, for secure design, um, also, if you guys would like to know more, please contact us offline. I have the author's information, and I can get you in contact with them. Finally, uh, the RISC-5 RISC is also being used in our ha hardware uh, software obfuscation architecture, where basically the idea is if you were to observe a program running, one time you would see it run, it might look like a mouse, or another time you'd see it look gigantic like a tiger. Um, and it does that through obfuscation and the decisions made in the hardware. Basically, uh, the idea is that you, you might, for the level of security you decide, the processor is reconfigurable and self-aware so that it can kind of try to meet a certain time, power, or memory I.O. budget and deliver that to you. So how does it do that? Basically, through hardware obfusc uh, software obfuscation, basically you run your code through a compiler and that obfuscated, it, the compiler spits out obfuscated code and an execution mask and then sends that towards SARA, our self-aware reconfigurable architecture, which is utilized basically a uh, brisk 5 processor that's been designed for security needs. And it decrypts the, uh, the obfuscated code using a mask. And then through execution, it makes decisions based on your budget what that program's gonna look like. So one time you may run an, you, every time you run an instruction, for each instruction, it's gonna have a different time, power, or memory I.O. budget. And so every time you run a program, that should be different each and every time um, for, to kind of obfuscate, if you were to run a side channel attack on the processor, you can't necessarily nail down what is going on. With that being said, um, I'd, we'd like to open up and invite everybody to kind of make some contributions or give us some feedback on our website if you, you get some time that interests you. Also, a quick note, the RISC-V RIS is actually leaving our lab as it's now being, uh, it's starting to be used in the 128-bit XPGAS architecture for uh, HPC and data centers. With that being said, thank you for your time and uh, you can get more information at ASCSLab.org, that's the website.